the party desperately needed a new idea. Elections didn't work. Attack didn't work. In the next stage of their self-inflicted decline, they decided to rise above the multiracial conspiracy. The National Front turned to God. They would become saints. I think we really did feel that we were higher above the other parties and that uh, by becoming a sort of a new person, a new man or whatever, that, uh, that the other parties just would not be able to, to cope with the, 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 the purity of thought and the, the ideas that animated these people. The man who brought them these ideas was no saint. Roberto Fiore was an Italian neo-fascist on the run. The Italian police also wanted to question him about people they suspected of the bombing of Bologna railway station, in which 80 people died. The fugitive got a warm welcome from young NF members. Roberto was certainly a very charismatic figure. He was a very young leader of um, uh, the section of the nationalist movement in Rome. Um, a very uh, magnetic personality with a great deal, at the time, a great deal more experience of political organization. Fiore persuaded the front to remodel itself on the pre-war Romanian fascist movement, the Iron Guard, which combined orthodox Christianity with a loathing for democracy. Its leader was the magnetic Captain Corneliu Codrianu. For a party trying to escape the Hitler tag, Codrianu was an odd hero. He thought the Nazis were soft on Jews, and his slogan was Long Live Death. Long Live Death, I'm, I'm sure it was meant in this way, that if you're prepared to say, not just I don't mind dying, but I'm happy to die for my beliefs, then what can your opponents do against you? Codrianu organized his followers into cells of elite cadres. The National Front did the same. They called themselves political soldiers. A key ideologist was Derek Holland. He had an austere view of the life of an NF activist. There must be analysis and study. Analysis and study devoid of personal interest, devoid of vague sentimentality. Study and analysis being central to our method. Holland, a devout Catholic, wrote pamphlets to explain the new Christian discipline. Many members were baffled. Derek Holland had some rather strange views that uh, we should all become political soldiers and um, almost be a form of an elite, you know, to, you know, to run the, the party and the country and all this type of stuff. and. One mustn't go out and, you know, drink beer and smoke cigarettes and presumably do what most normal people do. One should spend all one time being a political soldier, whatever that meant. Another obscure thinker Roberto Fiore introduced the NF to was Julius Evola. Evola was a fervent admirer of the Nazi SS and had advised Mussolini on racial policy. Both he and Codrianu despised conventional politics and thought the only way to unite the nation was to create a new Superman. The NF agreed. There was a feeling that if we are to win, we've got to have something far more than ordinary politicians. So to our politics, we had to bring a soldierly discipline and devotion. It's actually farcical, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, must have, somebody, some people must have believed it. Uh, some people did. I mean, it's... it's uh, yeah, what planet are we on, please? Uh, can I, uh, you know, welcome to the planet Earth again? You couldn't recruit along these lines uh, because people would think you're just balmy, quite frankly. And uh, let's face it, um, the organisation was, uh, was decimated. Like Codrianu, the political soldiers believed that once the new man had been forged, he should return to his community. Isleworth in West London was to become a test bed for the new community-minded nationalist. That individual would then act as a beacon for their community. Uh, so then we'd say, right, well, now you know what it's all about. Well, now 
find problems that need sorting out on your estate or in your area and sort them out. Just do them quietly and you don't particularly tell people you're doing them because you're political, they know you're political, they will know. Uh, and then from that we will gain grassroots support in certain areas uh, and then once we have credibility in certain areas then that'll, or success in certain small areas, that'll then give us the credibility externally. It was a way of outwitting the establishment conspiracy. It meant National Front policies without the National Front name. The political soldier keenest on this idea was Phil Andrews, a man with convictions for violence and drunkenness. In 1984, he set out the strategy for NF community activists. Members must be encouraged to join or set up tenants or residents associations. Taking control is likely to be child's play for two or three dedicated political activists. In Iselworth, Andrews set up a number of community groups. Today, he's no longer in the National Front. He's an elected councillor for his own party, the Iselworth Community Group. He refused our requests for an interview, but we caught up with him leafleting one morning. Mr Andrews, Jolyon Jenkins from the BBC. Yes, how are you? Hello. Why did you organise the South Isleworth Community Group when you were still a member of the National Front? Uh, there's never been a South Isleworth. Isleworth South Community Group. Um, because I've, I've been keen on the idea of community politics for quite a long time. At the time, I still had uh, certain views which um, you could you could say were uh, racist or nationalist. Um, but I was becoming to believe in the community idea. By building power in the community, the NF wanted to outflank conventional corrupt politicians. One man had had this idea before: Colonel Gaddafi. He became the latest in the NF's parade of unlikely heroes. In West London, Phil Andrews was his number one fan. Are you still a, a, a follower of Colonel Gaddafi? I was never a follower of Colonel Gaddafi. Are you um, in favour of his political views? Um, will you excuse me because I'm going to get the place. I'm going about my ordinary, everyday Just election Just asking business. you a question. Yes, and I've already discussed this with you. Um, I'm not a follower of Colonel Gaddafi. But in 1989, while on the National Front Executive, Phil Andrews presented the local library with a copy of Colonel Gaddafi's Green Book, which contains his ideas on an alternative to Western democracy. But you, you gave a copy of the Green Book to the library and praised Colonel Gaddafi That's right. to the skies for his ideas on democracy, which seem very similar to yours. Where Colonel Gaddafi or anybody else supports the idea of popular democracy, I applaud him. Colonel Gaddafi thought that parliamentary democracy was a fraud against the people. The National Front thought so too. But it wasn't just his ideas they liked. In 1987, leading members of the party went to Libya in search of petrodollars. In our minds was the fact that uh, Libya is a small country awash with oil money, uh, and if we want to build a serious nationalist movement in this country, we need to attract serious money, so had we been offered it, we'd have been very pleased to take it, and we hoped that we would be. All they ever got from Gaddafi were bulk copies of the Green Book. It proposes a new sort of democracy based on an intricate system of people's committees. And so do recent election leaflets for Councillor Andrew's new party, the Isleworth Community Group. But Gaddafi's ideas never really won over the people of West London. A copy of the Green Book uh, that Phil Andrews lodged at Isleworth Library um, was never actually checked out by a reader. So it would seem on the basis of that that there was very little evidence of an interest in the, the ideas of, of Colonel Gaddafi uh, in Isleworth. <laughs> Gaddafi's Arab nationalism showed the front that there were other people with nationalisms of their own. The stage was set for yet another ambitious but self-defeating change of direction for the ever-dwindling front.
they became pro-black. From the late 80s, they started championing black nationalists like Louis Farrakhan. They saw them as allies against the multiracial conspiracy. Black and Asian people who are committed to preserving their own racial and cultural identity have far more in common with us than we have with race-mixing white liberals. The NF now respected black people, although it still wanted them to leave the country. But to many members of the rank and file, civility to blacks was going too far. There's a branch somewhere in the north of England, I think it may have been around Manchester. They sent their papers back, they circularised us all with a handwritten note saying basically they, were, they didn't like this sort of thing. The National Front should just be a white person's organisation and basically they were off. As an attempt to undermine Britain's multiracial society, teaming up with foreign nationalists made sense. They could make friends with Arabs. They could make friends with blacks. Then in 1989, one of the front's leading members tried to open a dialogue with the oldest enemy of all. It was to cause the end of the National Front. I was phoned out of the blue by Patrick Harrington because he said he had a, a good story, a big story, to tell me about. And he arrived at the Jewish Chronicle in his trademarker full-length leather coat, yeah, which was sort of slightly sinister. And we went next door to the uh, pub. And then he started to tell me what was quite uh, an explosive story, which was that the National Front, which was uh, traditionally uh, considered a uh, and uh, if not a, a Nazi party, a sort of neo-fascist or crypto-fascist party, had decided that uh, it had been historically wrong in its attitudes towards the Jews. Despite the Jewish Chronicle's sceptical reporting of the issue, the majority of the party were horrified at Patrick Harrington's tactic. Patrick's approach to the Jewish Chronicle had not been discussed before it appeared. Uh, and in any leadership which is supposed to be a group leadership, that was clearly unacceptable. Um, that, as much as the message, was unacceptable. As I say, the message, you know, I personally at the, at the time felt that that was going too far. Nick Griffin came to see me. Um, the, the, ostensibly, it was to look at the price of property, houses and such like in Belfast, but then uh, it developed to a discussion about the way the movement was going and he was unhappy that, um, that some elements were opening up a rapprochement to the Jewish community. So he basically wanted such elements expelled and to keep the National Front going purified and renewed in, in this trend, uh, or failing that, that a new group would be set up. Within a few months, the National Front, or what was left of it, had been wound up. The name was abandoned. The remaining members split into two camps. We probably had something like 50 or 60 people, and Patrick Harrington's side had uh, 10 or 12 people. You're talking about tiny numbers of folk uh, who've managed very successfully to uh, build themselves a ghetto within a ghetto within a ghetto. The biggest fragment called itself the international third position. Today, it communicates with the world only through the internet. Its solution to the multiracial conspiracy is to cut itself off from ordinary society. The circle of conspirators has been enlarged. Not just the Jews and the media, but abortionists and city dwellers. They want to go back to the land. Only if we can put ourselves back in touch with the soil of these islands can we have a revolutionary politics that is both attractive and popular and which is vibrant with life. In other words, if we do not espouse ruralism in theory and in practice, we are no different from the deadbeats of the establishment. The place they chose to get in touch with the soil of their nation was surprising. They've set up a nationalist commune in France. They speak of their struggle to build a new society based on hard work and prayer. Getting your hands cut to shreds on briars or mixing concrete for 10 hours in torrential rain leaves you with bad hands and a bad back. 
If there are any Christians out there, they can remember this project in their prayers, because the spiritual struggle is the highest and most important. The International Third Position send out leaflets appealing for money to support this mysterious commune. Funds are urgently needed. They've always been very secretive about the location of the French Commune, and it soon became clear why when we tracked it down to a small village in Normandy. The deputy mayor unlocked the town hall to show us the records. The property was in the name of the wife of the front's Italian guru, Roberto Fiore. Only two people had regularly visited, and one of them had left in 1994. The other, Derek Holland, had supposedly gone to Italy. Once they had had big plans. We went to see the place for ourselves. I took a look round this nerve centre of spiritual nationalism. It was deserted and run down, but there were signs of religious fervour. Supporters are still getting sent begging letters, yet the property is actually up for sale. Quelle espèce de gens habitent ici? I mean, il, il... Non, vous savez, ils n'ont pas tellement habité. Hein? Uh -huh. Pas tellement. Hein? Oui, ils mais, 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 mais... Ils venaient un jour, trois semaines, quoi. Ils allaient et venaient. Uh -huh. Oui, oui. À Londres, à la, oui, à la oui, cité. Oui, sans doute, oui, sans doute, oui. Oh, c'est seulement les vacances ici. <laughs> oui, c'est ça, oui. 